in this edition of WUCF Artisodes. A painter with a passion for science and math. A lot of interest scientists and people that are more interested in math to the arts. And an artist whose precise designs embody a passionate desire to uplift. Hoping that my art will say something to somebody, to inspire somebody, to bring them some kind of peace, sense of purpose. It's all coming up on WUCF Artisodes. Jordan Senerans wants to share her art with scientists and science with art lovers, and her paintings are the vehicle for that synthesis. I am an artist first and a researcher second. All of my paintings involve a lot of math, so I have like a sketchbook full of just equations and figuring out triangles and doing a lot of trig. I had a lot of thoughts of wanting to switch to a science major because I was like, what am I gonna do? Because <laughs> at the time I had no direction of where I wanted to go with painting and I started really geometric. And I knew there was something there in it, but I couldn't tell you what it was yet. <laughs> so I started researching and somebody mentioned that it looked like diffracting light, like crystallizing in the sky. I was really interested in figuring out what else I could start diffracting. So I was looking at diffracting time and it turned out that was quantum mechanics. And then I started getting more illustrative of actual concepts, so I started going to the black hole and I did the nebula. Growing up in Fort Lauderdale, my dad was a landscape architect and I was really influenced by all of the drawings that he made. And I noticed that I know a lot about plants that I didn't necessarily try to learn myself. All of the house paintings I've done are on this one street in downtown Orlando. I haven't told them yet. <laughs> Everything is done with tape. And I think using tape makes it more graphic and clear. And then I make everything in this painting an icon. And I put this house on a pedestal where there's no other houses around it. And it's in this field of green grass that's all one blade at a time painted. And then once I'm pleased with the way the house looks and all the landscaping, I decide which areas I'm okay covering. I want it to be thought provoking and something you could stare at for a long time and try and figure out what it means. And when I put in the natural landscape, I want it to be both the past and the future that this plot of land could be. And it also brings back thoughts of this man versus nature and what we've done to this area. We've just like wiped it out completely and put in our fake birds and put our artificially groomed trees and just like reflect on what we've done to our place. I want to bring these new topics to different audiences and also interests scientists and people that are more interested in math to the arts. Art is such a huge part of science. Art is communication. Everything is communicating something. So art is just a new way of getting these scientific ideas to a new audience and a new type of public. As part of WUCF's American Graduate Initiative, Artisodes proudly honors our Student Artist of the Week as we bring awareness to the dropout crisis and encourage Central Florida's children to succeed. My name is Zachary Botchin. I am a senior at Mainland High School in Daytona Beach. At the end of elementary school, I used to play the recorder, but then I wanted to learn how to play an actual real instrument and I choose the trumpet is because trumpet is basically the instrument that creates everything. You know it's in jazz band, symphonic, it can be in a mariachi band, marching band. 
and I've been playing for seven years. I started playing viola starting junior year. A viola basically it can have a melody, it can have the harmony, it can have the counter melody. It can basically play anything like just like the way how it sounds has more of a deeper voice than a violin does. So I've been playing it through junior and senior year. Zach's one of my best students. Uh, Zach is an all around great musician. He takes it very serious. He practices. So a lot of times the directors, you tell students to do things that's going to make them better. Well, Zach's one of them students that's going to actually do and, and take the advice that you give and use that to make himself better. I'm going to plan on going to DSC for two years, transfer to University of Central Florida, and become a music therapist. Music is part of my life. I enjoy the feel of it, I enjoy, you know, sharing it with other people, you know. To have a student you know that does everything you say, uh, it works very, very hard for you and is always in place, um, it's very, very hard to find students like that. So I, I really see that he's going to be that student that actually takes his talents and use it to better himself. I like both of them. You know, Phil has a different sound than a trumpet, so, I mean, there's no negative way about those two. I just love playing those two instruments. Art Asserts congratulates Zachary Botchin of Mainland High School, our Student Artist of the Week. Armed with digital technology and a paintbrush, Jeannie Cameron combines elements of graphic design and fine art to communicate a message of hope. When I was a little girl, about the age of 10, I read a story from my school library. That story was called I Juan de Pereja. I was always interested in art as a little girl. My mother encouraged me through the years, and uh, so this book was interesting to me. It was about this assistant who became as good of an artist as the painter himself. I thought as a little girl, gee, if this fellow could become a fine artist, so could I. Later on, I took on a, a job in a printing company and learned hands-on all of the, the graphic design uh, software programs and so forth and found that I really enjoyed it because I found a relationship between graphic design and fine arts for its aesthetic uh, purposes, but also the design principles. There's use of grid, there's use of color, all of those things that are incorporated in painting are done in graphic design. My interest in fine arts began at an early age due to my mother, her encouragement, but mostly through my education later in life in, co in college, uh, where I learned that fine arts was a form of expression that we need to nurture and develop and, and foster. It's, it's a form of communication. Uh, for me, I believe that it connects us with the past, with the present, with the future. Uh, when we look at works of art from 50, 100,000 years ago, we can still respond in the same manner in which people did at that time that they were created. And so to me, fine arts is very important as a, as a vehicle for communicating ideas about our world, about our humanity. There's several things that have inspired me throughout my life as an artist, from being a young girl reading the story to my mother and so forth. But uh, I think the bottom line is that as a human, and all humans are creative, and I think that stems from um, a higher power. And for me, the belief in God, a creative, loving God, has driven me to create my works. That in addition to a respect for nature and its beauty. Uh, outside my studio window, uh, there's a bush, and in that bush, cardinals come every year, build nests constantly. Sometimes the nest survives, and this past year, the nest did not survive. I looked out the window and it was destroyed, and uh, yet the cardinals return. They come back and they keep rebuilding. So this set of paintings, it's entitled Perseverance One, Two, Three. Uh, tell that story, and for me it's an, an, an analogy in life. Uh, the first painting shows a nest, it's perfectly symmetrical, it shows the hope, the happiness, the plans of the cardinal couple, and uh, in its beauty, in its, in its uh, future. The second panel shows the destruction of the nest, where bits and pieces are flying about and, and it's been destroyed, yet behind it all is an underlying, underlying circle 
that still gives it some kind of underlying backdrop that yes, there's still some hope here. The third panel, uh, with all of the diamonds and the grid work and so forth, shows the rebuilding of the nest and the two birds have returned carrying their little pieces of nest uh, sticks and so forth and again a centralized focus in the center so they've returned to rebuild and have new beginnings, new hopes and like I said this is an analogy uh, in life we all go along things are going quite well we think so anyway and some hardships occur so maybe very devastating things happen and uh, we can choose to rebuild, move forward with hope in a brighter future, a new beginning. So those are very personal because of my own uh, circumstances the past couple years. Uh, what motivates me to continue to work in the field of art uh, is I think really the knowledge of the responsibility that I have as a creative person to say something, to have a message. I don't think art is made to be put in closets. That responsibility drives me. Also the satisfaction, I think, as, as one works in art, uh, that, that sense of oneness with the universe, a wholeness that you feel at times when you do create something. Things start to click and things start to come together and it gives you purpose. Uh, certainly. Um, other motivations might be um, different exhibits that I've been invited to, to, to do. Mostly it's about communication, hoping that my art will say something to somebody, to inspire somebody, to bring them some kind of peace, sense of purpose, solace, some unity um, that we have as human beings. About a year ago, Artisodes brought you the story of Orlando artist Matteo Blanco, who creates portraits of celebrities using most unusual objects like coffee beans or peanuts, even dog hair and sugar. Matteo's latest work is a tribute to singer Dolly Parton and her hit song, Coat of Many Colors. He used nothing but pieces of clothing to create the portrait. Nothing is painted. This is Matteo's 15th work of art for Ripley's Believe It or Not Museums. Painter Brian Keeler is known for his bold brush strokes and bright colors, but in all of his works, the unifying motif is his use of light. Brian Keeler, I'm a painter, and I live in Ithaca, New York. My art is in the, that tradition of uh, realistic uh, painting. I call it painterly realism because you can see the, uh, the effects of the process and the brush works. I guess I started drawing first, like uh, many people do. I started in grade school and started sketching. Then in high school, I started doing portraits. And then uh, between semesters at art school, I did uh, sketches at the boardwalk in Wildwood, New Jersey. And since then, I've uh, been doing portraits through most of my career. I did a lot of official portraits of judges uh, in Scranton and Wilkes-Barre for the courthouse. I do both uh, well, a variety of subjects or genres. I paint uh, landscapes, still lifes, figures, and allegorical works. And um, the choice is kind of a combination of things all coming together, coalescing into, a, into one, the, the light, the composition, uh, the topography, or if it's a figure or a portrait, the way the, way the figures pose. But uh, oftentimes the, the unifying uh, theme is uh, the light. It's the quality of, of light and um, the, uh, the, the way the light plays on it and the interplay of shadows and, and light. I have some art in uh, several public collections. One of them is in the Everhart Museum. They have a couple of my paintings in their permanent collection. And I've also done uh, commissions for corporations. Uh, one of them is an insurance company, TW Insurance Company in Wyalusing, where I did a, a large mural illustrating the history of their company. And, and the most recent one was about uh, five or six years ago. I did this large mural for a casino near um, uh, Stroudsburg in Mount Pocono, Pennsylvania, Mount Airy Lodge. It was a nine-panel painting. Uh, 
it's going to call a polyptic, and I did this painting of uh, uh, the Susquehanna River near Wailusing. It's kind of a, a large panorama at sunset with a lot of um, uh, violets and golds. teaching in various capacities over the years. I teach uh, landscape and figure painting in uh, two beautiful places in uh, Italy and we travel around to various other, other places so it combines uh, Renaissance art history and it's a great place to study uh, and to paint because you're immersed in the uh, epicenter of the Renaissance uh, where we teach. People just uh, would contact me, email me or, or telephone me to, to let me know that they're, they're interested. Each year we have people come that are uh, brand new to painting, uh, they're a tabula rasa, a blank slate, so it's, uh, it's open to uh, all levels and there's professional artists that come too and I'm very honored to have people that have been painting their whole life that come. Making something from scratch is very uh, fulfilling and rewarding, especially the, the plein air part, which is, uh, plein air is a French word that means painting out of doors and that's a very important part of my uh, uh, process is to paint on location so I can see what I'm looking at and experience nature firsthand and be part of the, uh, of the scene that I'm looking at. I just like to represent the, uh, the world that I see <laughs> rather than um, art for art's sake so it's kind of a combination of uh, expressing something intimately about what I see and experience and uh, with the design elements combined in it at the same time. Gustav Kaibot was a leader of the French Impressionist movement, but his paintings were largely hidden from public view for a century. Luckily, a recent exhibit at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. brought new attention to some of his most important works. Gustav Kaibot was an Impressionist painter, which is to say that he participated in the Impressionist exhibitions, which occurred between 1874 and 1882. He was considered to be the leader of the movement for several of those years. He was younger than Monet and Pizarro and Sisley and Cezanne and Renoir, but he brought a very sort of particular kind of vision to the movement. He dies young and he is independently wealthy. And so he doesn't sell his work during his lifetime. And there's really not much of a market immediately after his death in 1894. His pictures remain in his family for about a century. And then they start to, to come out in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. There are still not many paintings by Kaibot in public collections. Because he was wealthy and didn't have to sell his paintings, Kaibot has never captured the popular imagination, as did his peers, such as Monet and Renoir. But he recorded a moment in time when Paris was undergoing a rapid transformation from a medieval warren of narrow streets to the grand boulevards it is known for today. He is responding very directly to what's going on in Paris this extraordinary new urban landscape that has been essentially constructed during his young lifetime, so across the 1850s and 60s. Bringing together 55 works from collections around the world, this exhibition expresses the beginning of modernist painting. His first ambitious painting is the floor scrapers, or Les Raboteurs, and he submits it because he's on the track to be an artist to the Salon. It's sweaty, hot, boring, difficult work. There's a gigantic bottle of wine that's opened to the side of one of them. It's, um, they're gonna drink their way through it. Class tensions are running high in Paris at the time, and the salon is not ready for a stark off-kilter look at the laboring classes. The salon rejects the painting. So he takes that picture the next year and hangs it with the renegade group known as the Impressionists in 1876, and it causes a huge um, response. But it is Kayabat's next work, 
that will prove to be his most acclaimed. Ignoring the bright palette of the other Impressionists, he portrays the City of Light in an unidealized way, overcast and drizzling. He exhibits Paris Street Rainy Day in the third Impressionist exhibition. And it's big, and he knew that it would make a major statement, and it did, and it's all critics talked about. The umbrellas are fantastic, and they're utterly uniform, because everybody has gone to the department store and bought their black umbrella imported from the UK. There's a wonderful group of portraits. These are pictures of his friends, of his buddies, the people he hung out with. They're really portraits of, of his social milieu, um, that great painting of the guys playing cards in his apartment that he shared with his brother in his bachelor pad. There's an amazing group of still life paintings, of things that he would have seen in his very fancy neighborhood in the night the Rondis Mall on the sidewalks in the fancy uh, fruit and vegetable and butcher stores. The one that is taking, literally taking people's breath away is the butcher uh, shop picture from Chicago called Calf's Head and Ox Tongue, which is a, um, a pretty gory uh, example of contemporary um, industrial butchery and I think one of the most amazing still lifes of the entire century. He plays with space in almost every one of his canvases. It was something that intrigued him and that he turned in an expressive way to get at a particular kind of emotional, psychological tension. He was rich and supported his fellow painters. Because he loved what they were doing, he bought their work and ended up with one of the greatest private collections of Impressionism. Today, beyond his contribution as a benefactor of other Impressionists, Kayabat is being reevaluated as an important painter in his own right for the way he captured the moment Paris began to pivot toward the modern age. That's all for this week on WUCF Artisodes. Thanks for watching. For more arts and culture, visit our website at wucftv.org slash artisodes, where you can find future videos and more.